And a greetings and salutation to each and every one who ends up watching this broadcast at some point or another. And uh, I had what I call a, a flyby salute tonight. I don't know if I'm going to be able to play this in a way that makes sense. Let me see if I can do this. I'll uh, show you. If you look at the left side of the screen there, ah, there's uh, Leonard. Greetings and, yes, happy Monday to you. See that blip on the screen on the left side there? Let's see. If I keep going, it's going to keep moving. And now the thing I'm going to do is blow it up a little bit. And you may be able to see it looks like a space shuttle almost. No, it's not a space shuttle, but it's something that's just about as crazy. It's an F-35. Let me see if I can got to make this the right size again. Uh, zooming by my house about an hour ago, and there were two of them actually. And let's see. I guess this will do. But anyway, so I can do this. And whoosh, definitely a noisy thing. And uh, everything about it uh, seems to reek of, you know, to me anyway, uh, what's going on right now. So I will get into it a bit more. Yeah, those F-35s, they pass, they go up to, you know, Grand Canyon and other cool spots. Yeah, there we go. Got to show uh, a little bit of that for the spirit. And what I was going to say is, well, they start out at Luke Air Force Base outside of Phoenix area. I think it's, I can't remember which actual town they're in. I don't think it's Glendale, but whatever, uh, wherever that is, uh, Luke Air Base. And then they usually pass by my mom's house, pass up this way, not necessarily over my house like today. Um, and then they kind of work their way around the Sedona and Flagstaff and eventually the Grand Canyon and beyond up in those areas and do their exercises and then come back. And today I heard this booming sound coming at me and I thought, that's an F-35. So I grabbed my phone and turned on the camera and ran out the door as fast as I could. And the second one swung by and that's what you uh, see in the picture there. And he was pretty low because he was, I mean, when I blow it up like that, that's kind of what it looked like to me, you know, uh, so to speak, face to face. But anyway, uh, all that is wonderful, but even more wonderful. And it's the sound of freedom when you hear it go by. Um, we're going to begin tonight in this heathenism book. Last uh, Monday night, we got to do a uh, an overview. And then, so that was Monday. Then Wednesday, we were in Philemon. Oh, and on Monday night, we also, and we will be shortly dealing with uh, this manual a bit and what that has to offer to help people understand about exegesis. And um, so like Wednesday, it was Philemon. Thursday, I brought up some stuff that this week I'll mention tonight and Wednesday that a week from Thursday, I'm going to continue. And there's a lot more that happened this week. And on Saturday in particular, uh, some things happened. And I found out some things that some of you may very well be aware of as well. And if you're not, you will be by the time uh, by the time we meet up on Thursday, August 5th, for the second in a series that, well, and it's the second of two. I mentioned it this way. Uh, on Thursday night, let me see if I can put this up. Last Thursday, 
I gave a warning, an alert, uh, nota bene, note well, in other words. Vigilance required, be prepared, get ready, new waves coming now. Now, if you don't think that's true, if you don't get it, um, well, you will. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, but this past Saturday, we had a meeting. Let me grab something here. Um, I'm not going to show you that stuff, but we had a meeting on Saturday, and it's the first time that I've been to that particular uh, group, and they basically laid it out on the line. And I'm going to tell you, it, this should be enough. Uh, what I'm going to say should be enough to kind of bring your antenna up. I went to Costco three days in a row. I went to Trader Joe's three days in a row. And I even went to Walmart on Monday, or let's see, on, on Friday and on Sunday. So two out of three days. And if you wonder what was I getting and what was I doing, first of all, uh, supplies were not available at Costco. And some of the supplies came available by Sunday, but some of them are not available and there's a reason. And if you don't know about that yet, put on your antenna and try to figure out what's going on and you'll soon see that there are going to be well let's put it this way when a little more than a year ago less than a year excuse me a year and a half ago just a little less people were hard up they got caught with their pants down and no toilet paper need i say more so um Fortunately, the urgency isn't such that I need to say anything right now, tonight, urgently. But I would urge you and do so um, in a way that says it's got a bit, and that's why I use the word urge and urgent. It, there's a, a necessity for you to really get some things together and in order and get ready. And I won't say more about that because I don't want to mess things up. I do want to say something that's pretty cool that I think I figured out. Um, I had mentioned in the past that the three or four years of Periscope broadcasts on Mondays and Wednesdays, it's like four years. Let's see, how can I say this? Because it's about three and a half years of Mondays and two and a half years of Wednesdays because there's one year less of Wednesdays. I thought that all of those earlier ones were lost. And for anyone who asked or was interested, and I know at least of a couple people that have, um, I bring, uh, what do they call it? Good news and glad tidings. I went on to uh, the old, well, basically because Periscope went into Twitter. But I went back and back and back in Twitter. And as far back as I went, it kept showing Monday and Wednesday night broadcasts. And so apparently they didn't disappear because I kept sending them over to Twitter. And so maybe almost all the way back to the beginning, they'll be available. So, uh, for anyone who's interested, every so often I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find out more, and then every so often I'll try to mention it so that people can go back and start. For example, at the beginning of Philemon, or you know, there's different books we've done uh, a whole pile of them over there, about ten or ten or so already. This would be the eleventh one because this is book ten, but we did book twelve as the third book that we did. So I'm always one ahead. So if this is book 10, I've done, I'm into my 11th book. So all that to say, the good news is for some people, if they want to find old broadcasts, 
and go through those old books. They are, at least right now, available on Twitter. And that's another thing. Um, I don't know how long a lot of things are going to be available and possible because we do know that there's a lot of manipulation going on in what we get to see in here. So all of those kind of preliminary notes, just to say, uh, be on guard and we will continue to do what we do. If you're new to these broadcasts, you know, some of this stuff is going to be a little bit off the wall. And the reason is because we're talking about like it says up there, exegesis number 163. And most people say, what is exegesis anyway? We're going to be learning a little bit tonight from the exegesis manual about how we use in the world of exegesis and theology uh, a lot of resources that most people have never heard of or never seen. So everybody's seen the English, Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't know what it means. They just know it's some guy and it's a religion or it's Christianity or something. And, but all that other stuff below it, like Kuriasi Jesus Christos in Greek and um, Yeshua, Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew, you know, these things are significant. Um, and they're a part of people, what we should all know as, it, things about the God and creator of the universe that wants to have a relationship with us. But the thing is, he's not religious. And we're not talking about religion per se. So, um, like this board says, grace, and we're going to see something about that tonight. Grace and the gospel are good news. And religion is not good news. And true or pure Christianity, and that goes for true or pure Judaism, their original forms, let's say, are not a religion. And if you think Christianity is a religion and it's parent uh, Judaism from which Christianity comes, well, if you think that we're talking about religion, hear me out. And you will find out even tonight, because every time I... I do this, we do eventually hit the stuff that explains why this is not religion and how it's not religion. So we're going to get real quick into our usual, this last little, uh, whatever you want to call it, chart and board that I try to put up every time we meet to, well, I don't try. I actually, I think I generally do because it's important that we start this spiritual, theological, biblical, exegetical, supernatural, and other ulls, words that end with ul. Um, this, let's call it a StreamYard broadcast because I use that software, but it's on, uh, it's sort of via this periscope into Twitter. So it's on Twitter and, and of course on YouTube. And uh, Leonard's one of the YouTube viewers. And I see somebody else is watching. Don't know who, but hello. Because um, there's more than one viewer, apparently. But so this chart is brought up to explain something. And it's a little bit technical. But I'm going to make it simple and not explain the details. And hope you can get the details from past Periscope broadcasts or more recently on StreamYard. It's on YouTube and even on Twitter. What I do is say, everybody who's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you either know what this means or you hopefully know that before we start to study biblical things, you need to be in fellowship to understand these spiritual things. And fellowship means you need to be right with God and you need to be in such a way that your spiritual thinking uh what do they call it? What's that funny uh, put on your thinking cap? This would be your spiritual thinking cap. It's got to be on. And how do you do that? You have to be in this bottom circle filled with the Holy Spirit. And so through sin, we get out of that bottom circle and we end up having 
what we get controlled by our old sin nature, which is how we started in this life. And there is for the believer who gets out of here and over here, a solution, which is claim first John one nine and it's called rebound. And when you rebound through face, uh, first John one nine, uh, you go from being basically controlled by your old sin nature to being filled with the spirit. Okay. Now, anybody who's not a believer, it's as easy as believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It says that in Acts 16, 31 in the Bible. And uh, the truth of it all is that it's a gift. And we're going to see more about that tonight because uh, we're in this book called Heathenism. And it gets into that, especially at the beginning. I have an old copy next to the, or inside the new one there. Um, and so at the beginning of your spiritual life, well, all you have to do is believe in Christ. And what happens at the moment of coming to the foot of the cross and saying, God, I don't even know if you're real, but if so, I would like to know what the deal is. Well, at that very moment, when you say, I don't understand, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do what Philippe just said uh, and what he said, the Bible says more importantly, um, I'm going to put my faith in Christ that Jesus Christ, or as it said on the other board there, the Lord Jesus Christ is this special person. He is a unique person out of all human history who is the um, called the theanthropic person. He is theos. He is anthropos. He is God. He is man. There's something called the hypostatic union, hypostasis in Greek. And by faith alone in Christ alone, you get placed into union with Christ or Messiah, because that's what Christos means, Mashiach, which means anointed one. And at the moment of salvation, that you're indwelt by the God. So God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And not only are you, so to speak, indwelt by God, those three personalities in one, like an egg, you know, uh, shell, white, and yoke, three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, as at the moment of salvation, you are indwelt by the God of the universe forever and ever and ever. You are placed in the union with Christ for all eternity, but you are temporarily filled with the Holy Spirit. And through sin, you can get out of that bottom circle. And we already explained rebound, how you get back into it. Uh, so at the moment of salvation, you're filled with the Spirit. And for those of us who are believers, if for any reason uh, you are not filled with the Spirit, now is the time to pray and ask God to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's both known and unknown sins, which is in 1 John 1, 9. Um, and so we're going to take a moment now for silent prayer and get started. How about that? So uh, let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. It's something that we should thank you for every day and every time we pray. And every time we have the opportunity to meet, whether it's at a church or online or as uh, Joe Griffin in St. Louis, actually St. Charles next door to St. Louis at uh, Grace Doctrine Church, he talks about um, that every time we meet, sometimes it's through electronic contrivances. And such as everybody that meets, you know, on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays with me. So we thank you that at that time we have the opportunity to do what we're doing right now to make sure that we clear the decks and are filled with the spirit so that we have our quote, spiritual thinking cap, end quote, or unquote, um, have that going and that we are in fellowship with you and able to discern spiritual supernatural truth that comes from your word. And in this case tonight, we're going to be reading about it through a book by Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., who wrote many books on many subjects in the Bible to help us understand the Bible and to help us understand you and to have a better relationship with you. So please make it so that tonight is exactly that, that we get to know you better and have an improved relationship with you and are better focused on you, and that we're better motivated by the things that we look at tonight. 
So we thank you for all these things, and we ask them as always, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Christ's name, amen. And so, hopefully, if anybody was watching and did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, maybe they did that, and that would be great. And the reason that's important is because tonight we study about exactly that. All the people who do not have a relationship with God because they don't even know there's such a thing. And what do you do to change that? You do what we just talked about for five or 10 minutes. And uh, the bottom line is you place your faith in Christ and then you start to learn the Bible and you learn it by getting with people who know the Bible. Preferably you get to a church and you have a pastor who teaches the Bible isagogically, categorically, and exegetically. And that way you can really uh, get a lot of details that you otherwise would miss. And that's really important. And most people do not get that even though they go to church. That is a problem. And we will cover that in some detail tonight. So uh, here is the deal. Last week, we overviewed this whole book. And so I made some notes because this is my new copy. And I wrote over here uh, on the uh, left. Uh, I, I dated it. I got it approximately the 1st of July. I don't even remember what day it was. It's third edition from 2000. Um, let's see, third edition, 2001. Second impression, 2004. That's the current copy of heathenism. And I noted that we started it last week, exegesis number 162. And we are today number 163. We went over kind of the whole book. You know, I went through the table of contents and checked it out. So tonight, uh, I'm going to try to get us, so in earnest, really beginning the book and starting at page one and going through the, to the beginning of page seven. And later, we'll look at some things from the exegesis manual. And I pulled out about the 10 books or so uh, of, of various flavors that will be listed in the manual. And I took some pictures. So let me, uh, while I'm at that, let me, let's see, where did I, is it in the phone or is it? Okay, it should be, um, let me open up my photos app and pull the pictures up. I think I have only, only need two. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. All right, I'm pulling those out so that we can look at them and see if that's happening. Is it good? It worked. Good. So we're going to be able to, let me see, let me put that. Uh-oh. Oh, okay, here we go. And let me separate these two photos. Ooh, they're out of order. Okay. I'm getting it ready for uh, a little later here. And so there we go. All right, so now let's do this. Let's start. If you have a copy of this book, you can read along. If you do not, um, you'll just hear all the stuff. And in the preface, the Colonel mentions a couple of things that I talked about already. And I'm gonna read it since we're really starting at the next page, which is going to be, what about heathen? The heathen. So that's plural heathens, but it's really, they're called heathen and heathenism. So what about the heathen? So first, um, what the colonel would say, well, no, actually, this is just kind of repeating what I was saying. And it's not something the colonel would say every time, but it's at the beginning of the books at the preface. Before you begin your Bible study, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, be sure you have named your sins privately to God the Father. And then it quotes 1 John 1, 9, which is, quote, if we confess our sins, and these are the known sins, he is faithful and righteous to, to forgive us our known sins and to cleanse us from all, now that category is 
unknown or forgotten sins. And so it says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, those unknown or forgotten ones, 1 John 1, 9. You will then be in fellowship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit, and ready to learn Bible doctrine from the Word of God. And here's a good one, John 4, 24, quote, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in the filling of the spirit and biblical truth. Now, I'm going to say that when I do the little quotes thing with my fingers, it's because, look, some of these parts are in brackets, like God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in the filling of the spirit and biblical truth. And then um, I'll explain that in a second. If you have never personally believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, uh, the issue is not naming your sins. The issue is faith alone in Christ alone. Quote, he who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey, and then in brackets again, the command to believe in the son, so does not obey the son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John three thirty six. Now I'll explain those brackets, um, we call that corrected translation. And another way to say it is amplification. The words that are in Greek or Hebrew in the Bible, sometimes when you put them together, you have to add a little bit to those sentences, add a couple of words in there to make it a little clearer in English, in our language. So it's kind of funny that in another language, they can make sense without a couple of words that actually in our language, in English, we need a couple more words for it to make sense. And so um, when those words are added in brackets, that means he is amplifying what's in the verse to make it make more sense in English. And that is a part of exegesis that if you know the original languages of the Bible, and you have copies of the Bible in English. And remember, there are different versions and they word things slightly differently also for one purpose, to try to make each section, each sentence, each verse, whatever you wanna call it, make every part of it make sense and actually not add or subtract from what's originally there. That's very important. So, um, I read those couple of verses because in the beginning of a book like this, the colonel wanted people to know certain things before they start reading the book. And it's wonderful that he, you know, put these prefaces in. The next section in this little box here are the verses that he opened up with at Bible class every night. And when I say every night, he would teach up to 10 classes a week, though obviously more than one class a day. Sometimes he would teach on Monday mornings and Monday nights. Uh, sometimes he would have one class on Sunday morning and two Sunday night, or maybe it was two in the morning and one at night. I know in Las Vegas, we had six classes a week. We would have uh, under Pastor Dick Olson, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, including a before the Bible class, a prayer session, Thursday night, Sunday morning, and then two classes Sunday night, if I remember correctly. So it was one in the morning and two at night. And believe it or not, most of the people in the church, all of you who go to a church, know what it's like to see the same people all the time, but that's only on Sunday and some of the same people on Wednesday. Imagine seeing all the same people every day or on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And that meant that there was Bible class, there was Sunday school, there was the nursery, that everything was going on. And it was the same families, the same group of people that would come. Why? Because they wanted to learn as much as they could about the word of God and they really liked the approach of exegetical teaching. And that's why I'm calling this an exegetical uh, treatise or broadcast every time we meet. And so anyway, the colonel would start with these three verses to kind of loosen up the tongue. And uh, they are Hebrews 4, 12, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and 2 Timothy 2, 15. And this is how they go. 
And his son, RB Theme the third, Bobby, has been teaching now in his stead. Let's see. RB Theme Jr. was there from 1950 to 2003. And then Bobby started around 2003 and became the actual pastor and continued. That was starting around 2004. And he's been doing it ever since. And Bobby also reads these verses every time they start. So here they are. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints of the marrow and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for reproof, uh, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved, a uh, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he would say, open the word of truth to, and it would be whatever, chap uh, Ephesians chapter three, verse seven, you know, that kind of thing. Well, tonight we start at page one, what about the heathen? And here is what it says. People of primitive cultures have lived for centuries in the remote jungles and mountains and deserts of the world and so on. Wherever they are, these communities are far removed from the mainstream of commerce and civilization and chaos, in parentheses, I'm just adding that uh, for fun. Uh, so commerce and civilization, despite the advances in communication technology, they may be the Papuans, you know, Papua New Guinea, the Papuans of New Guinea, the Hottentots of South Africa, or an Indian tribe in the Amazon. Inevitably, the skeptic of Christianity will ask, quote, what about the heathen who have never heard the gospel? How can these people decide for or against Jesus Christ? End quote. Um, if the skeptic truly wants an answer, he should ask, quote, what about those who apparently have never heard the gospel, end quote. Although he may be ig ignorant of the facts of worldwide evangelism, the underlying implication of his question is clear. Check this out. It's clear. Quote, God is unfair, exclamation mark. How can a loving God condemn anyone under these circumstances? End quote. Okay, this is a good, good sentence. We're going to see this twice. This accusation against God is the very reason why we are here in the first place. That's going to get said again and explained, so bear with me. Okay, so we're on page two now, and look, it starts with the angelic conflict. It's going to explain about that. And I want to show you right now, there is a book called The Angelic Conflict, R.B. Theme Jr. Uh, it's fairly thick compared to this little book that we're in. You know, this is like 35 pages. And this one is uh, 160-ish, 170 pages or so. Um, you can get these books, including this catalog from RB Theme Junior Bible Ministries. And in this catalog, the old one was blue, or the second latest version. Um, in this book, you'll see everything you need, how to get the available materials. And guess what? At no charge to you. These are the covers of each of these many different books. Okay, and a little uh, summary of the books. So there are page after page of books, and then there are audio recordings and uh, video recordings. Let's see if I can get that over there. And you just order these things. You call them up. You you go online, do whatever you got to do. There's the information right there. See, there's a phone number, and you can call them, and they will send you the catalog couple of the first books for you to get started, which would be the plan of God and the Trinity. I call it the triunity because it's a triune God. 
And so if you call them, they'll send you, they'll just ask you for your address and send you the basics, maybe some audio stuff for MP3s, DVDs, whatever you need. And ask for this book. I think it's basics book 10. Yeah. Called heathenism. And that's the one we're in. So now we start on page two, the angelic conflict. And I get that. Yeah. Well, you can see it. Oh, I realized one thing I should do is hold things up and hold them up for a second so that they get in focus. Because I watched a recent YouTube. I was looking to see where I left off on something. And as I was trying to find that, man, there's so many times it's blurry and stuff. And so I would ask Leonard uh, if he wants to comment on that. Um, when you watch those YouTube videos, are there moments where if I bring up a text or something, everything gets all blurry? Because uh, it did when I watched it. And I have two different means to watch it because I save. I download and save and archive the sessions, but then I can just go to my YouTube channel. And I should tell people how to get to the YouTube channel. You just look up my name. Uh, it's spelled this way, and this is on my CD. Um, P-H-I-L-I-P-P-E-W-I-L-L-E-M-S. And... So anyway, uh, this is my home with you CD that's also available. Yeah, it sometimes takes a while to focus. Uh, Leonard just uh, commented here. And yeah, and that's why if I move in and hold it there, sometimes if it would have been blurry, it kind of catches up. But if I'm moving over here, then that causes other sections of the video to get blurry. And so I can't do much about that, even though we're at a, what, 1080p level of HD. It, it's just not the quality that it could be. So uh, if you'll hang in there, see what, uh, trying to hold it steady doesn't help. Wow. Okay, well, it may be because um, I'm way back and the CD is way up. and it causes the camera, maybe it's my MacBook Pro camera, to be confused what the subject is. And as a result, there ends up being a blur instead of a focus. So I wish I could do better than that because this is the, the better format. They offer it on StreamYard at 720p and 1020 or 1080 and so I'm on 1080 and it doesn't seem, when you say that's better now, well, that's because I'm not moving. But see, if I bring moving targets in, like <laughs> if I all of a sudden show this book, uh, you'll have to tell me, to me, it looks clear. But in the transmission, it may get all messed up. So I'll be curious uh, if you had that experience. Can uh, make a quick comment on that. Ah, uh, there. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. All right. Well, we do the best we can and we, the Lord takes care of the details. So in the end, we do get what we need. It's just not perfect. How about that for a problem? Ever had that problem before? <laughs> you get what you need. That's like the Rolling Stones song. You get what you need. What was that? Uh, uh, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> Sounds like what you won't. All right. So anyway, let's start at page two, the angelic conflict. And this way uh, you can get a, a good idea of what the other book, what I do with it? Yeah, here it is. The angelic conflict, what this book is about. And let me grab, I got to stand up for a second to go get one of my allergy uh remedies called dehist cheers
I had the screen, the sliding glass door, screen door open. Uh, what does it say here? But sometimes you get what you need. Yep. And uh, on these broadcasts, it seems that we're able to do that because there's a lot of good stuff in this book and in this book. And that's what we need. <laughs> yeah. My sinuses are a little bit overactive. And I imagine it's because I had the uh, screen door open after I watched the F-35s, you know, uh, scene, which was about an hour before uh, our meeting here. And uh, so, and the, the weather's beautiful, even though lately it's been rain every day. Um, a lot of uh, the monsoons, and I should say heavy rain. It's really crazy. Um, all right. So we better begin here because I'm going to have to stay focused. Otherwise, we won't get to page seven. The angelic conflict. Man was placed on the earth to resolve the controversy between God and the fallen angels. Footnote one, Arby theme, Jr., anti-Semitism, and also Satan and demonism. See down here, we've got all these footnotes. Well, um, those two books, uh, anti-Semitism and Satan and demonism, I even have another one called demonism. Let me show you that uh, here is the one they're talking about, Satan and demonism. And again, this isn't a really thick book. It's what? Uh, 100 pages. Demonism, this one's not available anymore. And it's pretty weird looking. And on the back, there's the kernel. This was from, let's see, I got it in 1980. It's from 1971, 1974 revised. Now I'm holding that up and I don't know if it's in focus or not. <laughs> but um, this subject, okay, and uh, the other book that I'm looking to see if I have it handy and, hmm. I don't see it in this pile here, so it must be, it's in the other room, and I won't bother to get it. And some of you have seen it before, anti-Semitism. Surprised it's not in the pile here, but I know I recently tried to go put a bunch of them back in the other room. I, I was reorganizing the house, I mean, as far as all these books. So it's not here, but anti-Semitism. Really a serious and great book. Let me see. There's the unfailing love of God. And, huh, I must have put that back. Unless, yeah, no, it's got to be back in the other room. In the office. Uh, as I've, oh, oh, there it is. I found it. It was buried. Uh, the office is where I have most of this theological library and a lot of the books oh, i'll grab this one too because i may be putting these back <laughs> here is the other one that's mentioned if you have the uh our text in the footnotes footnote one anti-semitism and it says 2003 and I'm looking now to see if that's the edition that I have. It looks like it is uh, the right edition. So many copies and editions. Yep, 2003, 1991, 1979, 1974. First edition published 1974. Fourth edition published 2003. And so this is anti-Semitism. And you can see it's kind of like our text uh, when you look at the front cover and then the back. See, these backs have been pretty much the same. So they used to have very different backs. Like here's a, another older one called Follow the Colors. And this having to do with battle. And this particular uh, shot shows scenes in the, um, uh, you know, the uh, revolution 
the Revolutionary War, the war between the states, because you can see their uniforms. And But see the colors there? That would be whoever was in front was carrying the flag, and everybody was following the flag. Ah, let's see. I got a comment from a minute ago that said that was good, meaning it stayed in focus. I guess you don't have to answer that, but I'm sure that's what you're talking about. So anyway, we continue, okay, because we're on footnote one where it talks about the anti-Semitism book and says, you know, pages 11 through 13, Satan and demonism, pages one through four. It also says, uh, hereafter, cross-references to my books will cite only author title, date of publication in the first reference, and page or pages. Then we'll get to footnote two in a sec here. All right, so man was placed on the earth to resolve the controversy between God and the fallen angels. And we had footnote one. How long this prehistoric conflict has been raging is unknown, but we do know uh, that angels were originally created in a state of perfection and possessed volition, which could act independently of God's will. Lucifer, the highest ranking and most beautiful angel, used his volition to revolt against God. Isaiah recounts the five arrogant, quote, I wills, end quote, of that uh, super creature as he, quote, walked in the midst of the stones of fire, end quote, in the throne room of God, Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. Now, here's a quote from Isaiah 14, verse 13. And by the way, it says footnote two, all scriptures in this book are quoted from the New American Standard Bible, the NASB. Bracketed commentary, like I was telling you about those brackets, reflects amplification of the NASB translation taught in Bible class lectures available on MP3 CD and tape from RB Theme Jr. Actually, not on tape anymore, MP3 CD and maybe DVD uh, from RB Theme Jr. Bible Ministries, Houston, Texas. All right, so here is the verse, okay? Isaiah 14, verse 13. Quote, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, end quote. And so again, that's Isaiah 14, 13, all, all in one verse. He did all that. The five I wills, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Uh, I will sit on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Okay, the five I wills of Satan, beginning of trouble. All right, one third of the angels chose to defect with Lucifer, and that's uh, Revelation 12, 4. From that time on, two categories of angels exist, elect and fallen. John 1, 51, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, Jude 6, Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And footnote 3 says, elect or holy angels are those who remained loyal to God in the prehistoric angelic conflict, Mark 8, 38, and 1 Timothy 5, 21. Fallen angels, so those were the elect ones, fallen angels or demons are those who followed Lucifer in his revolt against God and continue to serve Satan in his attempts to control history. See theme, creation, chaos, and restoration, and Satan and demonism. Now, I showed you the Satan and demonism book, and the other one that's called uh, Creation, Chaos, and Restoration. I have that one handy, but I should have pulled it up. Um, let's see, where, in which pile is it? Because I didn't grab it beforehand. Uh, is this the one? Nope. Oh, shoot. Got to go through. Ah. Got it. Got a couple of versions of it, too. Let me show you this is the old one where the colonel is in his uniform this is the current one so if you see them they're very similar right a couple of differences in the fonts and whatnot 
Uh, and I don't know if I'm screwing this up again as far as uh, the focus. Let me scoot over. All right, but again, these books are available. I'm trying to move them slowly. Um, they are available, and th on the back page, they have uh, information about the kernel and then the description about the book. And so this says that uh, creation, chaos, and restoration is from 1995. Now check this out. The third edition published 1995, but the fourth impression is 2016. So we actually have, let me see if I can get this. Uh, what am I doing so badly here? There we go. If you look there, um, where does it say? Because uh, I'm trying to read. Yep, fourth impression, 2016. So this is a very current one. I'm sure it hasn't been changed since 2016. And a lot of times there will be page numbers when the book has something to say in it that is directly related to our text. In our case, and if it doesn't say a page number, then it's citing the whole book and say, read the book if you want to know about creation, chaos, and restoration. So if I review the sentences we just read, you'll see why that applies. The sentence says, one third of all the angels chose to defect with Lucifer, Revelations, or Revelation 12, 4. From that time on, two categories of angels exist, elect and fallen. John 1 51, 2 Thessalonians 1 7, Jude 6, Revelation 12, 7 through 9. So you look at that subject, about a third of the angels defected, and then there's two categories, elect and fallen. By the way, I want to add, that means that two thirds of the angels stayed with God. So when you think about it in the war, in this big angelic conflict that rages on even today, um, there are twice as many elect angels on our side, on God's side, fighting with us as there are the bad guys. Well, just think about our country. And when you look at the picture of the country and you see the red and the blue, you notice how where the blue is. And you notice it's not the big amount, uh, a third of the angels can still cause a lot of damage. What I have to say about that. Continuing. At some point before the creation of man, a trial was held in which God sentenced Lucifer or Satan. He's got different ways of being called. And all of the fallen angels to the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41, Revelation 20, meaning Revelation chapter 20. Since the sentence has yet to be executed, we can conclude that the case was appealed. In fact, the titles ascribed to the super angel after his fall uh, lead us to this conclusion. Uh, Satan, or Satan, and Diabolos, and that means uh, di Diabolos equals the devil, mean, and in quotes, adversary, accuser, attorney, one who goes to court and appeals, Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. Satan objected that God's sentence was unfair. Quote, how can a loving God cast his creatures into the lake of fire? End quote. He impugned the character of God. I just want you to see how in this text, you have the Hebrew for Satan there, Satan, and Diabolos. And then you get to know what those words in part mean. All right, so continuing. Uh, Therefore, to answer Satan's appeal, God brought a new type of creature on the scene. Created lower than the angels, Psalm 8, 3 through 5, cross-reference Hebrews 2, 7, Mankind would be the extension and revolution, I'm sorry, resolution. So mankind would be the extension and resolution of the heavenly conflict. Like the angels, 
Humanity was endowed with free will and that free will would be tested to see whether man would choose for or against God. Consequently, man would come under close scrutiny of both the elect and fallen angels. Job 2, 1 through 3, Luke 15, 7 and verse 10 and 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Human history would demonstrate to Satan and his fallen minions that all of God's decisions are perfectly just and right, uh, consistent with all the attributes of his essence. And I wanna add there um, where it says that, uh, that consequently man would come under close scrutiny of both the elect and fallen angels. And you've got all these scriptures, Okay, part of the, the reason that we can't go through all of these scriptures is already it's taken so long to even read through because I add stuff, you know, to the text. And so reading five pages can take quite a while already. And if, if we go through all those scriptures, it's going to take longer. So I, again, encourage you to get the text. Then you have the scriptures listed and you can on your own time read them all. All right, the essence of God, next section. Derived from the Greek noun usia, essence is the intrinsic nature of something. It is both pertinent and, un, I'm sorry, permanent and unchangeable. My glasses are working fine. It's my brain that's out of whack. Um, in fact, let's see what happens if I take my glasses off. God in his grace has revealed his intrinsic nature by what he has created, Romans 1.20, uh, and by his activities in human history, John 1, verse 1 and 14, and through his infallible word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Remember, that's one that I read at the beginning that says, 2 Timothy uh, 2, let's see, which one do we want here? Oh, 2 Timothy 3, yeah, 16 and 17. Here's the deal. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So see that corroborates with this one, you know, sentence that, uh, and by his activities in human history, let's see, he has, I, I guess started at the beginning of this sentence, huh? God in his grace has revealed his intrinsic nature by what he has created, Romans 1.20, by his activities in human nature, John 1.1 1, 1, and John 1.14, and through his infallible words, 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. And so I just read that verse. Um, his essence is composed of essential qualities or attributes. These attributes or characteristics of God work in complete coordination and prevent any uh, compromise of his character. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one in essence, having identical attributes and are co-equal and co-eternal. And then we have another footnote, footnote four, that says the Trinity. So that's all explained in the second basic book, which you could order. Okay, now at the bottom of page three, the attributes of God. Quote, God is love, unquote. 1 John 4, 16. The love of God is absolute virtue and benevolence of his thinking. His love exists with or without an object. He does not fall in love, begin to love, or fall out of love. His love is rooted in every bit of truth and knowledge that reside in his perfect absolute essence. God's love can never be separated from his other attributes. God's love is perfect, eternal, uncompromising. It cannot change, decrease, or increase. Therefore, his love is never diminished by the knowledge of sin and failure. His love functions today exactly as it did before the creation of angels, the universe, or man, before anything existed apart from God himself. Furthermore, God always seeks the highest and best for the objects of his love, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But... God is not a, and here's in like semi quotes, sweet, soft hearted guy. Uh, and this little, little quote, who would acquiesce to anything in the name of love. 
His love can never be partial, biased, sentimental, or emotional, Romans 2.11. God's in eternal, infinite, and immutable love is inseparably, ah, I can't even say it, inseparably united uh, with his integrity. I think I tried to, to unite inseparably and united and got inseparably because <laughs> of the united. God is absolute righteousness and perfect justice. His righteousness and justice make up his holiness or integrity. God loves his own integrity. Now, remember that, I call it plus R and plus J. That's the way the Colonel described it. Absolute righteousness and perfect justice. They're absolute and perfect. And here's Psalm 33, five. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness. Uh, this word loving kindness is chesed in Hebrew. Um, full of the loving kindness of the Lord. And that word chesed or chesed, you have to almost spit when you say it, is a really important concept and word in the Old Testament and in, uh, let's call it uh, the Jewish faith, you know, uh, all the way back in the Old Testament. All right. Righteousness is the perfect standard of God. Justice is the absolute fairness of God. Righteousness is the principle of divine integrity. Justice is the function of divine integrity. What righteousness demands, justice executes. I've mentioned that before, and maybe you remember that. I've said it this way. What the righteousness of God demands, his justice executes. Okay, here it says, what righteousness demands, justice executes. God cannot ignore sin and evil and disregard the perfect standards of his integrity. Therefore, his justice must condemn to the lake of fire all who do not meet his perfect standards. It's impossible for God to render an unjust decision. To do so would be incompatible with his perfect righteousness. God treats all mankind alike without bias. Uh, and with equal opportunity, Romans 2.11, uh, were it so in our Constitution uh, that, uh, you know, with liberty, uh, indivisible, uh, you know, and the justice and, and for all and all that good stuff, right? How does it go? Um, you got to say the whole thing for it to make sense. Uh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, uh, with liberty and justice for all. There's the correct order. All right. God's righteousness and justice guarantee absolute fairness in all his dealings with mankind from his indictment and condemnation of the human race, Romans 3.23 and 6.23a, to his provision of the grace plan of salvation, Romans 6.23b. Now, what I want to do, let me see if I need to, no, I'll wait until the end. Yeah. Okay, well, I got to keep flying then. God, okay, so we're seeing different things about God, right? God is love. That was the first thing we saw at the bottom of page three. Then we see that God is absolute righteousness and perfect justice. We just did that. Now we look at his sovereignty. God is sovereign. He possesses volition and absolute authority. Psalm 83, 18b. God has ordained that divine will and human volition will coexist throughout human history. While God permits man to make negative decisions regarding his eternal future, he does not desire anyone to perish in the lake of fire, 1 Timothy 2.4. Rather, God desires that all might be saved. So remember, he's sovereign and he is a like a good king. He wants for everyone to do well, be happy, and all that. And, you know, I'll add this back about what Leonard said earlier. That was good. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. God is sovereign and wants everything good. And so here's 2 Peter 3, 9 on page 5. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And in brackets, it says, in, that all would come to a change of mind about Jesus Christ. In other words, that they would accept him. Second Peter 3, uh, 9. So that was Peter speaking. 
Now, the next characteristic, omniscience. The omniscience of God is his perfect knowledge and wisdom. God has always known all the knowable simultaneously. He knows everything about every individual human being, Acts 124. He knows who seeks and who does not seek salvation. Omnipresence, the next characteristic, the last one, omniscience, okay? Omnipresence means God is always present everywhere in nature, in history, in all the affairs of mankind, 2 Chronicles 16, 9a and Psalm 34, 15. There is no place in the world that he cannot reach with the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. So we hit omniscience, omnipresence. Here comes the next one. Omnipotence describes God's limitless power to provide gospel information to each individual, Luke 1, 37. These three attributes ensure God's absolute ability, meaning omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence. They ensure God's absolute ability to resolve the angelic conflict without tampering with free will. Okay, the next one is eternal life. God is eternal life. He is absolute existence. He has neither beginning nor end. His essence is perpetuated forever. Psalm 90 verse 2, Psalm 102 27. Unless we possess his life, we cannot have an eternal relationship with him. And in John 20, uh, 10, 28, it says, and I give eternal life to them, brackets, believers, and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 28. Now I wanna mention that when it says that I give eternal life to them, the funny thing is it's because he's giving his life, okay? So he's giving eternal life, all right. It's his life. But you want to get technical? For us, we receive eternal life at salvation, but we're not born to have eternal life. We're born to have everlasting life. And that life, when we die as a human on earth, our bodies, we physically die, but our life continues and it's everlasting. So it starts at birth and goes on. And after we die, we either go forevermore to the lake of fire or we die and go forevermore to heaven. But he does impute what it says here, eternal life to us, because that's what he has. But note the difference. We don't have eternal existence. So the back end of eternal life doesn't apply to us. Like we don't all of a sudden also go backwards and have life earlier that we didn't have before. The funny thing that I would think is, is possible and good would be that we can go and experience things that are a part of eternity that happened before we were born. This is a technical theological um, nuance that I'm making here. Think about it. If you wanted to see the movie of Moses coming to Mount Sinai and seeing the burning bush, that happened before we were born. But in heaven, I imagine we can watch that movie or go and sit there and watch it happen because we can go back in eternity past and nothing is stopping us from going everywhere in eternity because we have eternal life, just remembering that we didn't start at the beginning or before the beginning because there was no beginning for God. See what I'm saying? That's to getting technical. But I wanted to make that point as I read that little piece. So um, with re regard to eternal life, um, unless we possess his life, we cannot have an eternal relationship with him. That's why we share his eternal life. Okay, next characteristic of God. By the way, all of this is in the second basics book, the Trinity. Uh, I call it the triunity. And it's all of his 10 characteristics. Let me get it for you here. Okay, in this book, we have something called the essence of God. Now hold it up and hope that it gets in focus. And the 10 characteristics that we're talking about are right there on that little picture. 
That's what we've been talking about. But you get much more detail in this book. All right, continuing. So the next characteristic, and we're on page five, God is immutable. Quote, the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, cross-reference, Malachi 3, 6, James 1, 17. Therefore, it's impossible for God to change his character to accommodate any creature, whether angelic or human. In eternity past, God formulated one plan for the salvation of man. And his immutability guarantees his plan of salvation will never change. Psalm 33, 11. There is only one way of salvation. And here it is again. Acts 16, 31a. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Because God is immutable, he is faithful. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. You know, his, uh, his faithfulness uh, never ceases. That Old Testament first. Uh, what is it? His something never, well, let, let's read it. Lamentations 3. And it's like, ends with great is thy faithfulness. That's where we get the song. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah and lamentations 322 and 23 is it aha so it says uh the lord's loving kindnesses there again it's logistical grace and it's that word chesed indeed never cease for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is thy faithfulness and then 24 says, and 25, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. See, and hope under pressure. Um, and verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. So that section there, Lamentations um, chapter 3, verses, let's say, 22 through 25. Very good stuff. <laughs> All right, so I got carried away. I'm always getting carried away. Um, and where am I? Boom, there we go. His offer will never be withdrawn as long as man lives on earth. Hebrews 6, verses 17 through 19. Quote, God is not a man that he should lie, end quote. And where is that? Numbers 23, 19a. God is absolute truth. Now, the veracity of God, so this is the absolute truth, veracity, uh, where we get veritas, the Latin word, and veritable. You know, it's for real. It's, it's veritable. Uh, so it's truth. Veracity of God guarantees the truth of his word and promises. He has promised to reveal himself in every generation. Quote, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, end quote. So Titus 1, 2, and cross-reference that with Hebrews 6, 18. He will never go back on his word. God means what he says, uh, be it the gracious offer of salvation on the one hand, or the warning of condemnation on the other. Uh-oh, here's John 3, 36. Quote, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey, or in brackets, believe in the Son, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. End quote. So, John 3, 36. Therefore, when we consider the characteristics of God's essence, there can be but one conclusion. God is absolutely fair. When Satan sinned and revolted, God's decision to sentence him and all the fallen angels uh, to the lake of fire was compatible with all of his attributes, especially his love. Satan had not counted on the love of God providing every aspect of the solution to man's sin problem, Romans 5, 8. This irrefutable evidence of God's love is his answer to Satan's appeal and Satan's ultimate undoing. And now we have again, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son, 
okay? His only begotten, which means uniquely born. Monogenesquios in Greek. His it is a very important passage. So he gave his uniquely born son, that, and it's an adult son, Huias, uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God's love is demonstrated in every phase of his plan, uh, which we call Operation Grace. And that's the plan of salvation for the entire human race. Grace is all that God is free to do for mankind based on the saving work of Christ on the cross. In eternity past, God knew all of our sins and his righteousness condemned them. Then at the right time in history, his justice imputed and judged those sins in the impeccable humanity of Jesus Christ on the cross, Christ died as our substitute. And it, in Romans 5, 6, it says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And here is my chart tonight on that for you to see in the word grace, if you have never seen this, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. And I'll keep reading. I hope that was clear there. Um, there, let's see. There is nothing that man can do to earn salvation. Christ did all the work. The gift of salvation is free through faith alone in Christ alone. So it's back to that little term, a technical term, faith alone in Christ alone. And the verse for that in Ephesians, it's two verses, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. From generation to generation, God's gracious offer of salvation is made available to every member of the human race, regardless of geographical location, isolation, circumstances, or linguistic barriers. However, whether God's free, you know, italicized grace gift of salvation is accepted depends on man's volition. So again, The issue is grace, and the issue is volition, and accepting the work that Christ did on the cross as efficacious, that it propitiated God, it satisfied God, and that is effective, so efficacious, for salvation that anyone who believes in him will be saved and all of their sins forgiven because they were paid for, as it says right here, grace in a way means God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ bore our sins on the cross, past, present, and future sins, all the sins of mankind, of the whole world, and he bore them on the cross so that we could be saved. We couldn't save ourselves because uh, we have a sin nature. We're born dead spiritually. We have a body and a soul and no uh, human spirit. And that's because at the moment of birth, God imputes to us Adam's original sin. Adam was the federal head of the human race, the first man. And when he sinned, he... Uh, lost favor with God, he died spiritually. He had a body and soul and his human spirit died, which is why God said, do not eat of the fruit of that tree in the center of the garden. For doing so, the day you do it, moot de moot in Hebrew. Dying, you will die. That is a participle a future uh, participle, uh, demut, let's see, no, moot, which means that 
you could translate it in English, dying. Um, and then the future tense form of the word for death, moot, is demut. So moot, demut, dying, you will die. So when you think about it and you say, well, what does that mean? Well, when they ate of the fruit, they died spiritually. So they started to die. And uh, however many 600 or 1,000 years later, however long they lived, um, when they physically died, that was the you will die. So all of these things are supposed to make sense. And they do, actually. So we will see more about that in what the next page, well, the page we're on there, the unseen soul. See all the Hebrew? And I haven't given it away yet, but I told you that when we finish Philemon on Wednesday nights, we're going to go into the Old Testament where you will get a lot of Hebrew and you will learn a lot more about God and about uh, the story, what the Bible has to tell us. And then because of it, you'll be seeing Old Testament exegesis instead of New Testament exegesis. And so, so far on Monday night and Wednesdays, I've been doing mostly New Testament Greek exegesis. Uh, we do see Hebrew, and like next week in our text, we'll see some of the words broken down. That's Hebrew exegesis. So you do need to know Greek and Hebrew to be able to exegete the Bible. Now, you don't need to exegete the Bible. You need someone who can exegete, a pastor, an exegete, somebody who's trained in the original languages, the theology, the geography, you know, all of the things of the history, the things that make the Bible come alive. And so we continue tonight, and it's fun. We're going to go back into this text and for the uh, next few minutes we will as it says here continue with the exegesis manual uh i have taken some pictures so i've got screenshots to show you and this is very helpful because tonight we're starting with uh letter c lexicons and lexical aids for the new testament so let me open up these two pictures and get them out to where I can bring them up for us. I'm going to share them with you. And let's open this up and get to number 96, is it? And that should be, oh, interesting. That's not, let's see. That's the second one. All right, well, let's close that one and go again because we got to get to the first one. <laughs> I got them in, for some reason, I got the number wrong. I got the number wrong. So that's a Beatles song. All right, let me see what happens when I go to this one. Wait a second. That's what just happened. Let me check here. That's what, 97? What's 96? That's right. Well, I don't know what I did wrong. Hold on a sec. One more time. Uh, what, 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 what? I'm not sure how this is happening, but I'm going to try. All right. Well, this time I got it. All right, let's, uh, let me make that, is it any, but no, it's only centered. All right, I don't know that you'll be able to read that. But, um, wait a second, that's still wrong. Something's really wrong here, because I've got two pictures, and I go to either one of them, and I keep getting the, the second one. I'm going to try this one more time, because this is really screwing up. What is going on here? 
I'm going to try to decipher which one is which. It should be that 96 is the one I want. So I'm going to pick 96. Uh, wait a second. It just made 96 disappear. Hold on. Why? Oh, I know why. Okay. 96, right? One more time. All right. There we go. I don't know what happened, but I, I think I've got it right now. Okay, at the top there, it says letter C, lexicons and lexical aids for the New Testament. Then it says a lexicon, and we read this last week, this little paragraph. A lexicon is a guide to the meaning of a word. Uh, it aids the student by gathering together all the evident uses of a word and classifying them. Then a judgment is made concerning the meaning of the word in a given context. Now, I decided earlier today, I asked Siri, I said, what is the difference between a lexicon and a dictionary? Because in a way, they're almost, I'm not gonna say the same, but they're similar, uh, lexicons and dictionaries. Because a lexicon functions like a dictionary. So I said, well, I got to try and explain the difference between the two. And, or should I say the similarity between the two? You know, what, what's going on that makes it a dictionary or what's the difference that makes it a lexicon? And I, uh, I don't think I took a picture of it, a screenshot. Let me double check and make sure. Um, cause I may have, no, I didn't do the, uh, oh, man, I, I didn't save the, like the Wikipedia entry, but the basic deal is that they were saying that you go to a dictionary and it tells you a meaning or meanings of words and where they came from. But as it says here, a lexicon um, is a guide to the meaning of a word, and it gathers together all the evident uses of a word and classifying them, the different uses. Um, so it's a little, to me, more extensive than a dictionary. And here we go underneath in these points here. I've got, what, seven points. Let's see what they say. The major contributions of a good lexicon include one, root meanings and etymology. And it says cross reference Liddell and Scott. And some people call it Little and Scott, but anyway, whatever it is. Um, so, root meanings and etymology. The etymology has to do with the origin or origins of the word. So, you get these root meanings and the origin of a word. Now, Another one, number two, it says identification of grammatical forms. So example given, the principal parts of important or irregular verbs. So that's another category in a, lex in a good lexicon. Uh, three, a basic definition and or a series of meanings. Four, classification of the use of a word in a given context. So that example given is the lexicon becomes a commentary, starts to give uh, a little bit of detail about the usage of a word in a given context. So that's added information. Um, and then you have, um, let's see, uh, number five, concordance information. So example given, large lexicons attempt to include every occurrence, occurrence of most words in their classifications of usage. And it says, Arndt and Gingrich places an asterisk following an entry indicating that every occurrence of the word in the literature covered by the lexicon has been cited. So I get to see that once in a while because I have Arndt and Gingrich. There'll be an asterisk at the end and that tells me that is everything you could possibly find on that word. And that means they did a really good job of research on it. And they feel conclusive that they have gotten every instance and every possible, you know, uh, 
finding of that, the use of that word, and it's been listed in that um, lexical entry is what we would call it, you know, that location for that word in that lexicon. Okay, number six, local color. Example given, explanatory illustrations or suggested applications. And finally, number seven, bibliography. So we're way down here if you can see my uh, little, I know here it's an arrow, but for you it may be a cross, a little X, or I mean uh, up and down like a plus sign. But there it is on uh, number seven, bibliography. Larger lexicons often provide lists of references to other works for expanded discussion of a word. And so we're going to see this. I have a bunch of these to show you. So number one, it says, uh, and tonight we're doing this number one and number two, and we're going to stop at what's called letter D, as in Delta. Number one, suggested less lexicons, note abbreviations. So the first one is called Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, a Greek lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. This is the standard lexicon for the New Testament. And then you go to the next page. See, I got to go from this citing here. Let's close that. Let me add uh, the next page. And I hope I get it right this time because I can't believe I keep doodling and getting all of this stuff wrong. Uh, let me see if I can get it now. Uh, what does it look like? I'm going to try this one. Wrong one. All right, I'm going to do it again. Gosh, you know what's weird? It keeps coming up. All right, I'm going to try one more time. <laughs> Wait a second. This is right. All right. Thank goodness. I'm having problems with these, uh, whatever you call it, JPEG numbers. Um, okay, so I've switched over to what at the top there, if you can read it, it says page 25. And uh, I had finished the sentence. This is a standard lexicon for the New Testament and Apostolic Fathers, common abbreviation AG. AG meaning Art and Gingrich. So now I'm going to go to a bigger picture of me. so that I can show you the one we're talking about. This is AG, which stands for Arndt and Gingrich, but what it really says is, and this is the uh, standard, uh, see here we have uh, a translation and ad adaptation of the fourth revised and augmented edition of Walter Bauer's, and then in German, uh, uh, Griechisch, Deutsches Wörterbuch zu den Schriften des uh, Neuen Testaments und der uh, übrigen uh, urchristlichen Literatur by William Arndt and Wilbur, F. Wilbur Gingrich. And then it says revised and augmented by F. Wilbur Gingrich and Frederick W. Danker from Walter Bauer's fifth, fifth edition, 1958. So the Danker name gets in there. So you get Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich, and Danker, which is B-A-G-D, or bag, and you don't say the D part. But this is our standard lexicon that you've seen me use a zillion times uh, to be, uh, eat, what's the word, uh, evangelistic. You know, oh, there were a million people there tonight. Um, but so when you see words that I've shown you before that, you know, I would do a word study or whatever and look it up. This is the dictionary and it actually shows you, and it's probably all blurry and whatnot. But uh, this is one of the really basic important dictionaries. And so that's listed and let me try to make room to keep going. So that first one, Bauer, Art and Gingrich or BAG, and they say common abbreviation, A-G, Arndt and Gingrich. But bag was pretty common too. Letter B, ah, let's go back to our, ha, ha I'm able to do it. Um, the second one down, well, it's actually the first letter because we're on the next page, is B. Uh, it says J. Moulton and G. Milligan, the vocabulary of the Greek 
Testament, illustrated from the papyri and other non-literature, I'm sorry, non-literary sources. This volume presents selected portraits of local color from the world in which the New Testament vocabulary was used. Many citations are translated into English, common abbreviation MM, and that's because it's Moulton Milligan. Now, interestingly, this book is very hard to get. It's because it's a little bit erudite and, uh, I mean, obviously we're talking about illustrated from the papyri and other non-literary sources, but there's Moulton and Milligan. Uh, the vocabulary of the Greek New Testament. And uh, let's see, I guess I can hold it this way. And this book, they only make a couple hundred of them at a time. And so I may have mentioned to you before uh, how I was lucky to find this book in 1993. It says over on this page on the top there. Uh, I'm not going to bother to try to get it up close. What the heck? You know, 1993. And I got it used, and it had already belonged to two other people. This one guy, Steve Gardner, and somebody else. And then I put said it was his library, and I put purchased at DTS bookstore, used, 35 bucks. Well, supposedly when they make a couple hundred of these, they go for a couple hundred dollars a piece because that's how much it costs to make them. And since not very many people are buying them, they don't make very many copies. And it's much like any dictionary you would expect. You know, you can kind of see it just, it, it's got some English in there, but it's mainly, you know, a lot of Greek stuff. I'm sure that's not in focus. And it may be now I have an idea why things aren't in focus is because it may not be bright enough. It may need to be in brighter light. But again, because these are big books with very small writing, you end up using some kind of glasses or, uh, you know, uh, magnifying glass to be able to read these texts. And I can read them basically without my glasses, but the glasses are even better. And so, for example, here's a, an important word, thalema. And it's in English, it says, this word, which is almost unknown outside biblical and ecclesiastical writings, occurs in P. Oxy 6, that's a particular manuscript, uh, 1924, I'm sorry, 924, a Christian charm of Gnostic character belonging to 4th century AD. After a prayer to the deity to protect the petitioner from... It says A-G-U-E, et cetera. I don't even know what A-G-U-E is. The charm continues. So it's got a charm and it's got a footnote. And the, the charm says, Tau ta, uh, elmene, uh, uh, praxis, holos, kata, tethalema. There's that word, tethalema. Su proton, kai ten pistin autes. And the translation in quotes. All this thou will graciously do in accordance with thy will, that's that word thelema, uh, first and with her faith. And that's why it said, kai tain pistin autes. Uh, kai pistin and the faith autes of her. So, or with her. So, it, no, it's not with. It's thy will for, first and with her faith. And so then it gives uh, sightings and where, which library that it's in London. And then it says, uh, uh, Ta Thalema Tes Su Case Su. And it says, the Pauline usage of the word is discussed by Slayton qualitative nouns, page 52 and following. So it's a very good book for figuring out uses of words. It tells you the word, how it's used, and where it's used and what people have said about it. That's this book, the vocabulary of, uh, of all those uh, New Testament illustrated from the papyri and other non-literary sources. Now, the third text is called, uh, I mentioned uh, Liddell and Scott or Little and Scott. L when they say little, 
it always makes me think L I T T L E. And then it's something little, you know, little and Scott, but it's L I D D E L L. So L I D D E L L H little or H Liddell and R Scott. The Greek English lexicon. This is the standard lexicon for classical Greek literature. Its special value is the tracing of the origin and history of a Greek word, common abbreviation LS for Liddell Scott. So um, that is the one that most famously is best for pressing your pants because it is a huge, heavy book. I mean, you know, let, let me show you. This is my big you know, um, let's see if I can get this in here. Schofield Study Bible. Okay, there's my hand. There's the Bible. Look at my hand and this book. Look at these two books. Wait a second. Let me try and do this in a way that I got to make it the right perspectives. I don't know if I can do it. Um, here's, gosh, it doesn't do the job. Well, that sort of does. There. A big Bible, and then this thing. And by the way, this thing weighs a ton. So, and like I said, you can press your pants with it. Um, it weighs a ton. It's a zillion pages. Let's see how many. Approximately, well, there's 135 or 140 supplement pages. Here we're at 60. Okay. It's over 2,000 pages. It looks like it's 2,000. Here's a Greek English lexicon supplement that comes with it. 2,042 pages with very tiny writing. That's page 2,042. And then it's got hundreds more pages. And that after you flip this, it says Greek English lexicon of supplement. And so it shows you that. And I had to come up with a, a supplement. And then, whoops. Oh, that's interesting. I heard that. There's the preface to the supplement. Oh, I'm just going to quit. I'm not going to show you all this. This is nonsense. I mean, there's just so much. This is um, uh, Roman numeral numbers giving you the authors and cited works. And, you know, again, the writing is microscopic. And then beyond that, does it start? Yeah, those are still, yeah, here comes page one. And here we go again with the supplement starting at the letter alpha, you know, A. And so these books are just, you know, talk about voluminous volume, big giant books. They absolutely are huge and weigh a ton. I'm surprised I can put them all together on there, and then not have them knock the table over. So uh, here's a comment. That's like the dictionary in the library. Yeah, by the way, I have one of those kinds of English dictionaries. Here's a couple of other big and interesting books. For example, um, a synopsis of the four gospels, this book right here. And then here's a Latin dictionary. and and then, again, like Liddell and Scott, now, first of all, I'm going to show you the 2020 Webster's Dictionary, you know, the kind that we are all used to a dictionary. And then here's, like you said, at the library, uh, unabridged big old giant library style. And, you know, here you go again with all this microscopic writing. So that many big pages for, and that small writing, it's pretty ridiculous. So, uh, but to be an exegete, you need every resource you can find. You know, you need every different kind of you know, look at this, this home reference edition designed for the entire family. A 2,256-page dictionary with over 300,000 entries. 
over 2,000 spot maps and illustrations, presidents and vice presidents of the United States, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, a guide for writers, abbreviations used in the definitions, a pronunciation key, an etymology key, a manual of style. So it says, here is a complete reference library in one convenient, comprehensive volume. Yeah, right. Weights and measures. How many pages we got on this puppy? Also 2,200 pages. So, uh, so yeah, these are great tools, you know, great reference books to do a zillion different things. And that's why I told you, my house is a library. It's three libraries. You know, I have a musical library, a language library, and a theological library. And unfortunately, each one of them are really precarious and require lots of odds and ends. Okay, we're almost done here. Um, and so I want you to see from the Liddell Scott Greek English lexicon. Oh, looks like I got another comment. I think they come with their own table. <laughs> yeah, I actually have one of those tables. I bought it at some one of those imports stores where it was a neat, like maybe with a three-legged bottom, you know, and then it has the nice, well, like my music stands. I'm not going to show you that right now, but I have one that does that. And then what you do is you put the dictionary on it, you know, so that you can always go to whatever page and figure it out. So, yeah, that is uh, kind of fun. So, uh, all right. So, anyway, we continue from letter C was Liddell Scott. Letter D is, uh, says, I don't have this one, G Lampy or Lamp with an E at the end, a patristic Greek lexicon. This is the standard lexicon for Christian patristic literature. And that's why I don't have it because I don't read the patristic literature. Now, the next one is, it says, G Kittle and G Frederick, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. This specialized nine volume work gives valuable insight into the words and concepts of the New Testament and other relevant literature. Common abbre abbreviation, TDNT for Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Now, what I did is I brought three volumes here to the table so that I could show you uh, a certain way. I want you to see that the way this thing works, it's actually 10 volumes because there are nine volumes. And then, so for example, here's volume one and volume two. Okay, and the first one goes from alpha to gamma, A, B, C. And the second one goes uh, from delta, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, to the H thing is not H, it's eta. And it's a capital um, uh, eta. There's two kind of E letters in Greek. One is epsilon and the other one is eta. Eta is a long E. And so anyway, this goes from A to eta, so alpha to eta in two volumes. Okay, so it takes nine, seven more volumes. And you can see these are, again, big, thick books. Again, I will use my NASB, which is the same size as an NET Bible kind of thing. Uh, compare uh, a, a Bible. Let's see if I can do this well. To a volume of Kittles. Let's see, how do I do this? Yeah, because I just want to see how big these books are. And again, they do weigh a ton. It's great. You know, you don't have to buy weights. I have weights, but you don't have to buy weights. You can just lift books. All right, so there's two of the volumes. Well, remember it said a nine volume? So volume 10, what the heck is that? Ah, look, it's an index. And so again, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And then on the front, it says, editors, Gerhard Kittel and Gerhard Friedrich. Index volume by Ronald Pitkin. And that's volume 10, the index. And then over here, it has uh, a little quote, one of the few biblical studies of this generation that is destined for immortality. <laughs> must be saved. Journal of Biblical Literature, okay, JBL, as that is normally 
Okay, so that's important. And then it says, there's nothing else quite like Kittle in authority, New York Times. Can you believe that? <laughs> For a theological dictionary of the New Testament and a quote from the New York Times. So, um, yeah, these are very, by the way, the, the 10 volume set was around $600. I don't know what it is now. Leonard may look it up. But if they have the 10 volume set, of uh, TDNT by Kittle, uh, which is K-I-T-T-E-L. Again, this bunch of German guys, you know, German theologians. That's a reason that you're supposed to know French and German if you want to get into a doctoral program at Dallas Seminary. It was because you had to read a lot of French and German theological writings from the 18th and 19th century because they did a lot of great work. Wow, I'm getting overtime. Um, the next one is Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. Let me see if I can pull that up. I'll, I'll go ahead and get on the side here. Um, it says, an expository dictionary of New Testament words with their precise meanings for English readers. This volume provides interesting lexical insights. Now, I will show you that real quick. That's more of like what we call a regular sized book. Oh, I better do this again. And here it is. And Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, unabridged edition. And it's a very nice book and not small writing, so it's a lot easier to read. And it shows you, you know, the words. Notice it'll say verbs and it shows it in English and then it shows it in Greek. So, Leonard, this would be uh, probably a very fine book for you to get. Um, you would enjoy this as far as looking at details. Ah, so they're saying new is $400. The price has come down on, uh, on um, what's it called? The TDNT. And is that in 10 volumes? I wonder, and, or is it digital or what? Because uh, that can make a difference too. Um, Curious about that. And let's see. Okay, uh, uh, under, under number two, and I'll show this real quickly and maybe review it again next time. Additional lexical aids. And I have, there's one called J. Alsup, Index to the Arndt and Gingrich. Ah, 10 volumes. Okay, good. Um, Alsup's Index to the Arndt and Gingrich Lexicon. That's this book. And yeah, I'll have to explain these more next time. And then there's one called Gingrich, Shorter Lexicon of Greek New Testament. I don't have that one. Then there's S. Kubo, A Reader's Greek Lexicon of the New Testament. And I have this one, Saki Kubo, a Japanese guy. Reader's Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament. We'll have to look at these next time because I don't have time tonight. And then Bruce Metzger, remember the guy that, that did, for example, on this uh, Greek New Testament, and we looked at this was the UBS 3, and I showed you that he was involved in this one. It says Kurt Olland, Matthew Black, Carlo M. Martini, Bruce Metzger, and Alan Wittgren. And so Bruce Metzger is listed right there. And these guys are very involved. Again, this is the UBS3. We saw this last week, third edition of the United Bible Societies. Well, he also did this, Lexical Aids for Students of New Testament Greek. That's a very useful book. And then there's one more that I don't have, uh, E. It's C. Morrison and D. Barnes, New Testament Word Lists. Now, I do have some other books with word lists. Um, but not that one. And I have another grammatical aids for the new side. We'll see those later, I think. But anyway, we'll um, stop here. That takes us and ends at, at the bottom there, letter D, which we'll do next week, I guess. Grammars and grammatical aids for the New Testament. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't put this in about uh, uh, 10, 10 volumes and then a yep. So, um, we will kind of look at these in a little more depth 
because we didn't get to. And I'm hoping that we can also get into the next area, which will start being on grammars and grammatical aids. But I hope this helps for you to see that anybody who wants to do serious exegesis and translation of the Bible and understanding after you translate it, what it means, and then how to explain it to people so that you don't give an explanation. They go, well, it's not true because actually it means this. So you get that a lot. And I don't mind getting that, but I always put it down and I put them down because if they're not an exegete, I'm going to be able to slam them. Now, if they are an exegete, then we're going to actually have a discussion. And that is like I say, after the discussion, if, if it was friendly and productive, then you can either have another cup of coffee or part ways. But anyway, so that's the poop on that. Let's uh, do our usual getting ready to close in prayer. Remember the prayer board, um, the routine for prayer is fourfold. You got to be in fellowship, so rebound if necessary. And the second thing is thanksgiving to God. The third thing is intercession. And there's all those categories and areas by which you may proceed, you know, in different areas of for and of prayer. And then finally, the fourth thing on the other side there on top, it says petition, where you get to uh, make your petitions known to God. And I'll remind you that on the other side of that prayer board is my CD that I would uh, appreciate if you listen to it online. Um, any of the songs on there on my Home With You CD. And I don't know what's going on with the new one because things are getting so hectic, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Remember, I told you next week, on Thursday, so a week from Thursday, August 5th, we're going to be talking about what's coming. And it may come even before I get to it. It may be coming soon to a house or city near you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of serious stuff going on. And I hate to say it, but it's very serious and in a bad way. So if you have an opportunity to stock up on everything you need, now is the time to do it. And remember on Thursday, the title board um, for the special, you know, what broadcast on an evening where I normally don't even do a broadcast, except once in a blue moon. Um, where did that picture go? Yeah, here it is. I tried to make it kind of obvious that it's important now. Warning, vigilance required, be prepared, get ready. And what that means is whatever you want, get it now, get it while you can, and we will hopefully have enough for the time being. So we'll close in prayer and continue on Wednesday night in Philemon. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and for the things that we looked at tonight and the seriousness of it all and also the wonder of it all and especially in a part of there where it talked about your love. You love us and as we get to know you, we love you back. And But you loved us. It's not because we loved you. You loved us and it's because of your integrity. So we thank you for that and we thank you for all these blessings that we have and the wall of fire around us. And I ask that you do a special uh, blessing upon everybody who watches this and, and saw this broadcast and who is being prayed over right now to, that they would be blessed and protected. And again, this wall of fire is all we need. Uh, we stay in fellowship and have a wall of fire around us. And we thank you for that and for all the things that you show us and teach us to make it clear that you are real and that you care and love us and that you have a plan and it's a fun plan and a good plan. And we can withstand all of the flaming arrows and missiles and whatnot of Haponeros, the evil one, as per Ephesians 6 in the spiritual war that we're in, as well as a real biological, economic, and World War III war that we're in. 
So um, thank you again for the things we studied tonight. Please sanctify these truths to the nourishment of our souls. We ask all this in Christ's name, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. And so there. And uh, if anybody sees this and missed the beginning, please uh, check it out when you can. It'll be on both um, Twitter and YouTube. And that way you can catch the whole deal. And so have a good night. I'm going to wrap it up here and now. And uh, we'll hope to see you on Wednesday night when we're in our closing final weeks and month or whatever of um, Philemon. And uh, thank you, Leonard. You're very welcome. And thank you, anybody else that's watching. Uh, appreciate being together and doing all of this good stuff. Yeah, here's another uh, good night to you as well because um, it is getting late. So have a good rest and hopefully see you Wednesday night. Thanks again for being here. See you later.